Hello and welcome. I'm Aitari, and this is the seventh episode of the Budget Watch webinar, hosted by Rappler and Eileen. This episode is co-hosted by the Commission on Human Rights, the Alternative Law Groups, and Akbayan. For this episode, we will talk about justice, security, and human rights in the 2021 budget. Uh, to give us an overview, we will be joined by Robert Sanders Jr. He's a policy researcher in ILEAD with a primary focus on economic development and public policy. He has worked on several projects with local and international development organizations and serves as a consultant for key policymakers. Hello, Robert. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'll, I'll share my screen so we can get started. Um, so Yun, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, for, uh, for joining us this afternoon. This is a very uh, interesting conversation to be having. Um, especially after the Senate has just passed their version of the general appropriations bill. And um, I think it's one of the more overlooked portions of the budget. It's one of the more um, overlooked um, parts of appropriation because usually you know, the instinct goes towards education, health, social services, and deservedly so. Um, but we should also be paying attention to justice and human rights and security for that matter um, because they also form part of our everyday life. No. But before we go into the budget figures, just um, a, a small overview of how we've been doing so far. So recently, the Philippines has scored lower in the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. Our overall score is 0 0.47 in a scale of 0 to 1. So we lie here, 0.47. The global average is 0 0.56. And then the regional average is 0 0.60. No. So the global rank, we rank 91st out of 128. Um, in the region, we're, the thir we're 13th out of 15. Um, and then the recent years, our score has gone down. So in 2015, we, our score was at 0.53. At 2016, it was at 0.51. And then it's been 0.47 from 2017 to 2020. So um, the, the score has decreased definitely since um, 2017. But it's also worth noting that we weren't really that high up in the first place. Um, 0.530 still is a score that is below the global average um, today, below the regional average. Um, addition, in addition to that, um, just uh, just a, a more stark comparison, um, a decrease from to, uh, compared from 2016 to 2020. So a score is 34% when it comes to right to life. Um, big depreciation down to just 18%. So 97th out of 113 countries and then 125 out of 128 in 2020. For due process, 35% um, um, down to 31% in 2020. And then civil, li civil liberties uh, score of 38 down to 34. So the scores weren't really that good in the first place, but, but they really just worsened. No. Um, and then we have drug wars, EJKs, the anti-terror law, and a slow justice system. Um, the International Criminal Court has opened a preliminary examination or investigation on the, on the war on drugs um, that was committed at, since at least the 1st of July, 2016. As a result, the Philippines has decided to withdraw from the treaty that makes us an, a part of the International Criminal Court. Um, we, that's because there were a lot of EJKs during that time. And when we talk about EJKs, not really just related to drugs anymore. Um, more and more in recent times, we, uh, we get more news reports of people being shot in broad daylight. Um, anyone really, so just an ordinary person on the street, um, human rights uh, lawyers, um, you have activists, you have community leaders um, being shot uh, in broad daylight. And it really brings that feeling of um, impunity and helplessness. No, uh, we're really looking for. We're, we're really forced to um, ask questions as to where really is um, human rights or like security in all of this. Um, there's also the Anti-Terror Act, which was passed in the middle of a pandemic, and um, the provisions uh, they invite questions as to their constitutionality and, of course, the susceptibility to human rights violations and abuse. Um, on top of all of that. It's almost a stylized fact 
a well-known fact in the country that the justice system in the Philippines is rather slow. Um, the, the wheels of justice in the Philippines turn very slowly. Um, they're quite expensive. They take a lot of resources. So um, there's also that problem, uh, the question of is, really, is justice really accessible uh, to the ordinary person, especially for, those, uh, for the least of us in society. So we look at the 2021 proposed justice and human rights budget. Uh, we also look at the security budget uh, in comparison. Now, um, theoretically, these three things, justice, human rights, and security, um, they should all be in consonance with each other. They should harmonize with each other. Um, but of course, recent events have caused us to question or doubt those assertions. So uh, just an overview first of the 2021 proposed budget. It's the highest it's ever been, 4.5 trillion uh, for 2021, compared to 4.1 trillion in 2020 and 3.8 trillion uh, in 2019. When you break that down by sector, you see that the highest uh, share goes to social services, 36.9, and then economic services at 29.9, general public services, 16.1, debt burden, 12.4, and then defense, 4.7. So when we talk about security, we're talking about this purple line here uh, at 4.7%. But then when we talk about law enforcement, uh, human rights, etc., etc., we we'll look at the uh, the yellow line uh, at 16.1%. Um, that's the cost of running government. And that's really where uh, a lot of the budget that we'll be talking about today is lodged. So we will tackle a lot of departments really uh, because it's a spread out function. But first we go to the OJ, you know, quite eponymous for the topic. Um, from 2013 to 2021, the budget increased basically. So 10.19 billion um, in 2013, up to 21.59 billion uh, by 2021. Uh, when you look at the breakdown, office uh, there's an increase across the board, really. So for the Office of the Secretary for Department of Justice, that is 4.6 billion. Uh, it finds itself all the way up to 7.3 billion in the 2021 gap. And then Bureau of Corrections at uh, a little under 2 billion. In the 2016 GAA, it's now at 3.6 billion in the 2021 gap. So um, it increased to 4 billion in 2019, but then found itself decreasing in the 20, in 2021. Bureau of Immigrations, 840 million, almost doubling to 1.578 uh, billion in 2021. Uh, Land Registration Authority is relatively more stable, more inert. So 947 million in 2016 GAA to 1.121 billion in the GAB 2021. NBI uh, received an increase, uh, 1.2 billion in the GAA up to 1.9 uh, in, the, in the GAB. Office of the Government Corporate Council um, almost doubled actually, it really doubled from, but the figures are still uh, quite small, um, 93.8 million up to 193.4 million. And then Office of the Solicitor General, a uh, big increase as well. So 600.9 uh, million in 2016. In 2021, uh, it, I know, it is set to enjoy 1.1 billion uh, for, the office, uh, for the office. And then Parole and Provision Administration, 628 million in the 2016 GAA. And then 983.6 um, in the 2021 gap. Then President, Presidential Commission on Good Governance, 100 million in 2016, one for seven in 2021 gap. So if you remember, PCGG is the commission that was constituted to recover ill-gotten wealth. So, interestingly, uh, here, this is an office we should pay attention to, uh, the Public Authorities Office, uh, a little over 2 billion in 2016. By 2021, more than double to 4.657.4. And then um, specific programs in the DOJ Office of the Secretary, a lot of it really goes to investigation and prosecution services, probably because that's the main job of the DOJ, really uh, the prosecution arm of the government. So um, for 2020 GAA, out of the 6.8 billion that goes to the office, 5.67 billion goes to investigation and prosecution. Um, general admin and support increased by 16.7%. Support the operations increased by 17.3%, the law enforcement 6.3%, et cetera, et cetera. So an across the board increase. What's noticeable here 
is that the increase is really from GAA to GAB. That is the appropriation from last year to the, to the proposed appropriation by the executive. When we look at the uh, GAB version, that is the difference from the version proposed by the executive or the office of the president to that that is approved by Congress, there wasn't anything that changed. So basically, uh, Congress in wholesale approved the proposed budget uh, for the OJ. And we see this trend really a lot in the rest of the uh, agencies that are concerned with administration of justice. Um, Congress just, I know, just passed them wholesale. Um, a visualization of that table, you really see that investigation and prosecution takes a lot of uh, major DOJ programs. And then secondary, or far second and third, are legal services and corrections. Visualization again of the first table, um, Bureau of Corrections and POW, uh, they really take you know, a big share of DOJ's uh, budget. Massive increases in Bureau of Corrections uh, from 16, 17, 18, all the way up to 2019, it shot up. Same with uh, public attorney's office. So, uh, gradual but big increases, um, biggest increase in 2019. And I think uh, it would be good, it would be a good question to ask our panelists later if um, this increase in POW uh, funding has also been felt um, by those who seek uh, legal representation. Uh, Parang, is the additional funding from the public attorney's office being felt by those who need access to the courts, who need, um, know, who need competent lawyers, especially that who come from government? Next, we go over the ILG very quickly. Um, 2013, it's 91.2 billion, increase all the way up to 244.3 uh, in 2021. So it's almost triple. You know? um, when you look at the attached agencies, a very small portion of that goes to the ILG Office of the Secretary. Now we see that uh, the largest share goes to the Philippine National Police. At uh, 2016, it's at 88.5 billion. But by 2021, GAB, it's 190.5 billion. So um, gradual, rather gradual increases as well. So 2016 to 2017, from 88.5 billion, it became 111.6 billion. And then 2018, another around 20 billion increase to 132.3 billion. And then bigger increase uh, by 2019 because it's 173. So now it's around 40 billion, uh, the increase. And then in 2020, around uh, what 14 billion. Uh, and then by 2021, GAB, it's 190.15. It seems to have stabilized around that. So you notice this, this increase probably in line with the doubling of the salaries of the policemen and other uniformed personnel. Um, same trend you see in the Bureau of Fire Protection. So 11.4 billion in 2016, 12.98 billion in 2017. And then increase again in 2018. The biggest jump happened in 2019. From 14.75, it became 22.3. And then it seems to have you know, held stable there. Same with Bureau of Jail Management and Penology, 8.061, then to 11.629 billion, and then to 14.5. By 2019, big jump again, 19.87. Uh, and then it seems to have you know, held stable by then. So other items really just either increased marginally through the years or they uh, held stable. But we see that the focus or the, the large majority of the funding that goes to the ALG really goes to BNP and then BFP and Bureau of Jail Management and Technology. So just a visualization, this is how far, uh, how far the, the difference in funding is. Um, but we, we're not necessarily making any value judgments there. It's just that these are the figures as they stand in the, in the departments. So we take a closer look at the BNP budget. 2013, it was only at 67.4 billion for the entire country. That's the entire law enforcement budget of the police uh, in 2013. By 2020, when it's at 190.52, so tripled uh, in a span of uh, eight years. When you look at their programs, uh, the biggest actually goes, so out of 187.3, the biggest share goes to crime prevention and suppression, uh, that particular program. 142.8 billion went to police patrol operations in 2020. 
uh, for 2021, that increased to 5.9 billion. So the police uh, got more funding for their operations uh, in 2021. Um, general admin and support lower by around 2 billion. Uh, and then support operations, minor increase as well. Procurement, transport, storage, and distribution, minor increase. Intelligence and counterintelligence, minor decrease. The Philippine anti-illegal drug strategy was unchanged from last year. It's still at half a billion. And then the construction of police national of the Philippine National Police Medical Plaza uh, got 500 billion additional funding uh, in 2021. Then the camp development fund got slashed in entirely. So from 1 billion in 2020, uh, it's just zero here. So again, you notice the same trend. Um, what the funding that was proposed by the executive uh, was really was largely retained by Congress. So they just approved what was submitted to them. And then um, part two of that, uh, we see an item for the ending of local communist armed conflict in the PNP. We'll return to this, uh, this, this, this language later on because there's quite a controversial item there um, under the LGSF. So one billion for that in the 2020 GAA, retained in 2021, and then uh, approved by, the, uh, by Congress. Crime investigation program increased by 4.1%. Same for police education, only 1.2%, and then education and training, 1.0%. So um, on average, more greens, meaning more increases compared to reds. Uh, and then those that decreased, uh, they weren't really that major, except for this camp development fund. A visualization of that, this orange line that represents police patrol operations. So compared to other items, you see uh, how, how big the share is. And I, I think it, it just makes sense that the police patrol operations they take up the bulk of it uh, because it's it goes to the law enforcement aspect of the BNP. We proceed to DND. So we're done with police. We're going to funding for national defense and later on the army. So in 2013, it got 80.42 uh, billion, 2013. And then by 2021, it now has 208.71 billion. So the, the increase is quite gradual here. Um, 80.42 in 2013, and then 82.27 in 2014, 99.92 in 2015, and so on and so forth, until it reaches around 200 billion. So effectively, um, it, it more than doubled uh, in a span of eight years as well. So when you look at the component agencies of the DND, uh, you see that generally there it's, it's an increase. Um, so Office of the Secretary, decreased act from uh, eight by 80 billion from 2016 to 2021. But then the bulk of the funds doesn't lie uh, in the office of the secretary. It lies here in the army. We'll get to that later. So government arsenal, uh, quite steady really, at 1, 1 billion in 2016, up to 1.3 billion in 2021. National Defense College of the Philippines, 67 million in 2016, around 97 million in 2021. It didn't really change that much. Office of Civil Defense, uh, I think this is the, uh, the, around the central office for uh, disaster response, and maybe it also plays a key role in uh, the Anti-Terrorism Council. One billion in 2016, and then 1.19 billion in 2021. Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, uh, around half a billion steady uh, from 2016 to 2021. Uh, it enjoyed some increases in 2017, 2018, but eventually those were trimmed down uh, by the time we get to 2021. Veterans Memorial Medical Center, uh, just, just uh, no, small increases as well. 1 billion in 2016, it got up to 1.7 billion in 2021. Here we get to the big items, really the DND. These are what make the bulk of national defense or the defense budget of the Philippines. So 47.5 billion for the Philippine army uh, in 2016. And we see that gradually increasing through the years. Uh, an addition of 10 billion in 2017, an addition of about 6 billion in 2018, and then bigger, more than uh, around 15, 16 uh, in 2019. 1 billion increase by 2020, and then uh, I know we see 4 billion by 2021. So it doubled effectively. 
From 2016, it was 47.5. By 2021, 96.8. And this is a common theme that we're seeing. Right? So PNP uh, almost doubled uh, from 2016 to 2021. We're seeing the same uh, in military, um, doubled or more than doubled um, in, in the span of five years. Same for Air Force, uh, although the change or the increase isn't that drastic. Um, 16.4 billion for uh, Air Force in the 2016 GAA. And then the sharp increase, you notice as well from 2019, I think this is around the time of the, when they um, started implementing the additions, the doubling of the, the pay of the military. That was also 2018. So increased by about 5 billion, and then 2 billion increase in 2020 GAA, uh, around the same. Uh, by 2021, that's 29.8 billion. Philippine Navy, um, same story, 16.3 billion in 2016 GAA, 20 point, uh, 21 billion in, in the 2017 GAA, up to 27.8 billion in the 2019 GAA, 29 billion in 2020, and then by 2021, it's at 31.152. So almost double for Navy. And then uh, AFP General Headquarters from 33 billion uh, in 2016 becomes 20, in 2021, it becomes 45.48 billion. Take a closer look at the AFP budget. So again, as you saw um, here, more green lines that indicate increases than red lines or white lines that indicate um, decreases or just no change. No. So the total budget for AFP, that is Army plus Air Force plus Navy um, plus General Headquarters, it's 186 billion. And then in the NEP, it was increased by 17.259 billion. So a net increase of 9.3 billion. In the GAB, um, Congress decided to add 2 billion more to the AFP budget, and we'll see that later. Uh, for Army, um, I know, I'll just just single digit increases really 4.7 percent uh, overall budget, and then land forces defense program. This is 4.3 percent. This goes to the sustainment of the force, the development of the force, and then their support services. Um, Air Force naman it's at 12.7 percent, so uh, bigger increases relatively proportionally from 26.4 billion. It's now up to 29.8 billion. And then air defense program increased by 15.3%. The general admin and support actually uh, decreased by 22.1%. And then uh, sustainment, development, and support services all increased. Most notable is the increase in force development. It increased by 3.6 billion or 31%, the original uh, level. And then we look at Navy, 7.2% um, increase. General admin and support decreased by 11.3%, but the rest of it uh, got increases. Uh, some of them in the double digits. So Naval Forces Defense Program, that's 9.8% uh, increase. Biggest increases were in force development and force sustainment at 15% and 17% respectively. No change from NEPTA gap. And then um, general headquarters in the AFP. Uh, a lot of figures to process here, really, uh, but it's really just showing that uh, the, there were many increases in the security sector. So 19.7% um, increase from 2020 to 2021. More funds were poured uh, into the AFP. So 17.6 million increase in general admin and support, 42.1 million increase in joint force uh, in joint force planning, 214 million increase in joint force operations, and then joint force capability increased by 7.2 billion. Really. So um, AFP modernization jumped from 25 billion to 33 billion uh, from 2020 to 2021. And then on top of that, Congress added 2 billion more. So effectively, from 2020 GAA to 2021 GAP, 10 billion additional funds for AFP modernization. And then uh, last, under the government, local government support fund, we have the support to the Barangay Development Program of the NTF LCA, National Task Force for the Ending of Local Communist and Armed Insurgencies Armed Conflict. So it's 1.626.8 1, uh, billion. No, I think this is uh, 16.44 billion. Anyway, uh, major AFP items. 
Uh, a lot of it goes to land to the army. So land forces defense program, uh, air force and navy. They're kind of the same when you look at the dark blue and the orange line. Um, joint force operations lower compared to them, and then AFP modernization almost at the same level as Air Force and Naval Defense Program, right? So we move on from the security sector and we go to the judiciary. Um, and this is really one, one, uh, one budget item that isn't really examined, mostly because of fiscal autonomy. Um, the, the judiciary is one of the three great branches of government. Um, and it's given a lot of leeway in how it spends its money because um, if Congress interferes or the executive interferes in how the judiciary of course spends its money, um, then it puts into question the separation of powers and the independence uh, of the officers that sit supreme in those separate branches. So you also note here, there's a big increase from 2013 to 2021. So 17 billion in 2013. And by the time we reach 2021, it's at 42. 3.4 billion, so quite considerable, also more than double um, in a span of eight years. So overall, the judiciary from in 2016 had 26 billion. Uh, that's for the entire court system. And then by 2021, it got 42.3 billion. So um, a lot of that goes to the Supreme Court and the lower courts. So in 2016, out of the 26 billion, 23.6 billion came from the Supreme and lower courts. And then in 2021, it's that 37.7 billion. Um, the Presidential Electoral Tribunal got much the same, really. It's 88.3 billion um, increased incrementally from 2016 to 2021. Now it's at 138.7 uh, billion. In Sandigan Bayan, it started at half a billion um, and worked its way up to almost 1.5 billion in 2019. But then that was trimmed and trimmed uh, in 2020 and trimmed further in 2021. It's just uh, under 1 billion. Court of Tax Appeals, uh, 1.5 billion in 2016. It doubled uh, in 2021 at 3 billion. Sorry, that's Court of Appeals. And then Court of Tax Appeals, it's at 285.8 billion in 2016, 2021 in gap. Um, so the yeah, uh, same really just increases in the there were increases in the Supreme and lower courts by 2 billion. PET was cut by 6.2. Sadigan Bayan cut by around half a billion. Court of Appeals increased by 55 million. And then Court of Tax Appeals around 150 um, billion. And then a visualization of that, a lot of it really goes to the, to the Supreme Court and lower courts um, in, in deciding cases, in hearing cases, et cetera, et cetera. And then some go to Presidential Electoral Tribunal, Sandigan Bayan, Court of Appeals, and Court of Tax Appeals. These, of course, are other forms of court, other courts you know, uh, that hear cases. And then lastly, the, uh, the CHR, the Commission on Human Rights. So from 2013, it was at 298 billion, it's, it's funding. And then 2021, proposed is at 857 million. The CHR uh, has been well, uh, for those who look at the budget, it's really one of those items that has consistently gotten you know, one of the lowest appropriations uh, in the budget. Um, 2016, it was at 439. And then it got around 300 billion in 2017, at 724. Um, cut a little bit in 2018 and then increased again uh, in 2019 and 2020, and then cut back. Uh, in 2021. When we look at uh, the composition of the CHR, you have the CHR proper. So 439.7 billion in 2016, 2021 it's 817.8. And then Human Rights Violations Victims Memorial Commission established in 2018. Um, and it really has a uh, fairly consistent appropriation since then. Uh, changes, you see more red lines here. Uh, compared to what we saw earlier in the security sector. Decrease uh, by 8% in total new appropriations. There was an increase in general admin and support, but only by 1.3%. And then uh, around one fifth of its funds for supporting operations was slashed. 13.6% was uh, taken away from human rights protection, 11.8% human rights advisory uh, program. So. These are their major programs visualized. Uh, human rights protection, uh, biggest share, 
really. And then human rights promotion and human rights advisory, almost the same levels from 2016 to 2021. Uh, it's relatively you know, the same proportion. Now, uh, we come to this broad uh, proposition that we observe when looking at these, uh, these, these agencies that are concerned with security, human rights, and um, justice. So we find a stronger emphasis on law enforcement and security compared to administration of justice. Now, um, when you add PNP, National Police Commission, AFP, Pension and Gratuity Fund, then Office of the President's Confidential and Intel Funds, you get around 568.5 billion. Um, and this is just a very rough calculation. Uh, it's not exhaustive to include uh, every, every other uh, instrumentality or body that is connected to security. It works out to about 568.5 billion. But when you look at administration of justice, uh, the OJ, judiciary, BJM, PCHR, it's 85.593 uh, billion. So um, ideally, there would be no conflict, uh, theoretically, because uh, security, law enforcement, administration of justice, they really go hand in hand. Um, they're different parts of a process uh, because Law enforcement and security, they're there uh, to, in, to keep the peace, uh, to enforce law and order in society. And then once that peace is broken, for example, a law is violated, that's when administration of justice sets in. Uh, that's where the prosecution happens. That's where uh, uh, PAO extends uh, public service, um, legal assistance to those who can't afford it. Um, and that's where the court, that's where the courts acquire jurisdiction over to hear these cases and administer justice. In cases of abuses um, by state elements, that's when the CHR steps in and investigates um, those instances. However, you know, um, I think as our panelists, I think we'll we'll talk more about this later. There is just there's been cause for concern, um, really, about um, whether some whether you know whether the funding for law enforcement and security is really in good faith, and whether there is a culture that um, parang causes people to be wary of law enforcement and security, especially with passages of uh, vague laws like such the Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, etc. Um, so ideally they go hand in hand, but somehow there's 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 reason why people think. Um, are, are kind of scared by the avalanches and in what the government favors. And when you zoom out in the bigger picture, this is really what it looks like. And this is what we've been showing for the past weeks, um, that the priorities lie this way. Human capital developments versus physical infrastructure and security forces. Um, the latter is favored. So DSWD uh, doesn't really increase that much. Education doesn't really increase that much. CHED, same. Dole, same, DTI, same, small business and tourism, same. Um, the big increases lie in physical infrastructure, DPWH, DOTR, and in security and law enforcement, as you saw in PNP, Army, Navy, et cetera, et cetera. And then the introduction of the, ND, uh, the new item for NDF, LCAC, Pension and Gratuity Fund, which is uh, quite significant, 116.19 to 172.9. And then, of course, the confidential intelligence expenses. No. We're still not sure where the funds for the Anti-Terrorism Council will be taken for, uh, taken from, because uh, there's no item for funding the Anti-Terrorism Council. But it could be taken from a lot of sources. And um, from what we see, there are a lot of funds uh, to, to fuel it, probably coming from the security sector. And we, we consider this uh, hand in hand with these other concerns. That we're in the middle of the global and domestic recession, uh, that there's a widening fiscal deficit, um, that there's increased unemployment as a result of the pandemic, more returning OFWs, lower OFW de deployment and remittances. So all of these, uh, they, you know, they really come to factor in the security situation, law enforcement and justice situation, especially if you adopt the uh, human security framework, which is more holistic. Um, 2021 is pre-election year, so uh, we're always on the, on the lookout for uh, more funding on state elements, especially state security forces, um, because we're afraid that some of them may be used for abuse or uh, to, to game some, some elections. Challenges to the delivery of key services. And this is what we've been talking about for the past weeks. 
social protection, education, various extension services like agriculture, jobs, etc., health needs that are not COVID, and then disaster response, as we saw just this month. And then also preparations to implement the Mandana's ruling um, that has quite the special uh, place, especially when you consider um, the relationship of law enforcement and local governments and then military forces as well. And then other emerging infectious diseases that could really uh, pose a challenge um, to administration of justice and most of all access of people um, to justice and peace and security. So uh, with that, I end the presentation. Um, it's, it's a lot of numbers to take in, but it really just goes to this broad proposition that we found. It's really stronger emphasis on law enforcement and security compared to administration of justice. Um, I lead will stop there. Uh, will will not uh, will not make a value proposition on anything else. It's just an uh, objective observation. So thank you, Ramin Salamat. Thank you, Robert. Um, I see a lot of students today um, in the chat box. Hello to the students, to the senior high school students of NBDU. I see you're watching from your homes in different areas now in Sargent. Anyway, um, thank you, Robert, for your um, presentation. Again, for those who just uh, tuned in, I am Ikeri, and he is uh, Robert Sanders. We will be joined by our panelists today to give us an assessment of the presentation on the justice, human, um, human rights, and security budgets in the proposed 2021 budget. Um, we are joined by Attorney Gian. Um, um, Sir Carlos Conde also is here. Um, Miss Princess Molen, Mole, Mulieno, Mulieno, sorry, um, and um, Ma'am Eta Rosales. So, um, okay. Uh, so, Attorney Gian Nico Arabejo is a lawyer in the law, Alternative Law Groups, a network of legal um, resource organizations that work with the poor and marginalized groups. Previously, he worked as a legal editor in the Human Rights Victims Claims Board, which grants compensation to the human rights victims during the Marcos era. Um, hello, hello, um, Attorney um, Arabejo. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Um, so. We are also joined by um, Sir Carlos Conde. He is a senior researcher at the Asia Division of the Human Rights Watch covering the Philippines. He has done research on extrajudicial killings of activists, journalists, legal professionals, peasant leaders, environmentalists, and indigenous peoples. Uh, hello, Sir Carlos. Uh, you're on mute, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Erika. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, Miss uh, Princess Moleno, uh, Moleno, sorry. Um, is also here. She is the head of the Project Development Division of the Commission on Human Rights. She has been connected with the Commission for 14 years. Yes, hello. hello. Good afternoon to everyone. Hi. And lastly, um, Ms. Eta Rosales. Um, Loretta and or Eta Rosales is the former chairperson of the Commission on Human Rights. Um, she is now the chair emeritus of... Um, Akbayan Citizens Action Party List. As a human rights activist in the martial law era, she was a victim of torture under the Marcos dictatorship, yet remained, in, uh, remained active in the mass movement. Hello, Ma'am Eta. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, boy, yes. Oh. We hear you. Okay. Um, so, um, first, oh, no, um, can I... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask for your assessment of the DOJ, the PNP, AFP, um, CHR budgets um, in the proposed um, uh, in the proposed uh, 2021 budget. Of course, uh, we know that uh, the BICAM is already um, will be happening soon, given the passage of um, the budget bill in the Senate. So I guess we'll start first um, with um, um, with Sir Carlos Conde. And then with um, Attorney Gian, and then with um, Mom Princess, and then Mom Eta. Sure. Um, that was a terrific presentation by Robert, and I think it gives us a, 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 a broad view 
Uh, in fact, he, he drilled down into the numbers, uh, but you know, uh, a broad view of, of expenditures that the government intends to, to have. And uh, the contrasts are quite stark in terms of uh, you know, the emphasis on security, law enforcement and security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, human rights, justice, and the judiciary. And I think this is, this is not surprising. This is, in fact, I think, consistent with the overall policy of this administration. And that policy is, uh, should be viewed in the context of the drug war and all these other attempts to, um, to uh, undermine civil liberties and democratic institutions in the Philippines. So in a way, you could say that the government is, um, uh, you know, there's a, uh, they have all the money that they need for the security sector, but not not a lot on, on these other aspects of, 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 of our society. And that is quite uh, concerning. So again, my, my general reaction to the presentation is that uh, this is consistent with the overall policy of the government, which tends to disregard human rights and civil liberties, uh, particularly in the, in the campaign against drugs. And we can discuss later on uh, you know, details about the CHR, for instance, and all these other agencies that we think are under underfunded, um, not even just underfunded, but underutilized in terms of, of making sure that human rights are um, enforced or up upheld uh, to make, uh, in, in making sure that accountability is uh, achieved. Uh, there are a lot of other agencies in the, in the government that um, exist, but are not given enough attention, uh, enough mandate, and uh, obviously enough resources. But, um, uh, you know, I go back to my earlier point, which is that this is consistent with the overall policy of the Duterte administration. Thank you, Sir Carlos. Attorney Gian. Right, so wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, let, I, I'll begin by saying that now that we're talking about the justice system, it's not as easy as giving more money translates to a faster justice system. I wish it was that easy though, because a lot of cases in court are drug related cases and it's taking its toll on the justice system. And even if you say there are designated drug courts, it still burdens the prosecutors and public attorneys in terms of caseload. And majority of the victims uh, come from low income households and you know they can't afford private lawyers. So they turn to Pau. But, and to be fair, Pau is able to give that service. However, due to the heavy caseload, like a single Pau lawyer could, could be handling like 50 or 100 cases, same with the prosecutors. And the courts drastic, that drastically slows down the justice system because of the heavy caseload as well. So sure, we can have more funding for the public attorney's office, prosecution services, but it's being offset by the sheer amount of drug cases coming in. And you can see that with the number of people being arrested, which justifies the increase in the Bureau of Corrections and BJMP appropriations. So it's like Pau is catching up with the number of arrests, but again, bigger budget doesn't necessarily mean faster administration of justice. It will help, but if the government policy is too punitive, we'll, we'll stay on this track. There's also overcrowding in jails and it's only getting worse. So we need to look at the justice system and budget allocations beyond just giving more money to these specific agencies. We have to look at the government policy. And as a policy recommendation, there is a movement in the human rights sector to push for the decriminalization of drug use primarily, which is different from outright legalizing drugs, to be clear. By decriminalization, we, me we mean to say it's not by, by not penalizing drug users so much. And we can do this by trying to remove the penalties for possession, for example, because as it stands, our current drug law penalizes, uh, I mean, you can already get penalized for possessing as low as 0 0.01 grams of shabu. Now, this, these kinds of punitive, uh, harsh provisions is not only abused by law officers, law enforcement agents, but it also clogs jails and court dockets. And, you know, I've brought this up with representatives from the DOJ when the alternative law groups was invited in a consultation with NEDA. And they agree, actually, they agree that we need to decriminalize possession. And they agree that the current drug law is too punitive. Even the, the PIDEA, PIDEA knows this, right? But, but that's the law and they have to enforce it. So my take on this is instead of just, 
you know, dumping funds more and more and scaling up the law enforcement, we need to allocate more funds for social services. Because you see, there's a lot of underlying reasons why people use drugs in the same way that there's a lot of underlying reasons why we have local communist armed conflict. And this is rooted in the socioeconomic cultural rights issues. If we ignore the root cause of these issues and just put our funds on law enforcement, we're not really solving the problem. It's just a vicious cycle of inefficiency and clogging up of, of cases. So to sum it all up, um, we just need to decrease funds from law enforcement and invest it more in social services, overhaul the punitive justice framework and shift to a more restorative justice type framework. Aside from civil and political rights, let's also try to meet economic, social and cultural rights. By doing so, we are addressing the root causes of drug use, local communist armed conflict, and hopefully that will hasten the justice system or they could, it could catch up and recover from it. So I'll stop there and maybe we can talk more further later on. Uh, thank you, Attorney Gian. Um, Mom Princess? Yes, thank you. Um, it was a really good presentation, actually. Um, it's quite interesting to see that the, the figures, um, there's sort of an imbalance, actually. Um, the budget for the justice sector, um, budget for the security sector, and then budget for human rights. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, there was um, a time, I think way back 2017, when we were threatened to be given, which is 1,000 peso budget. I mean, how can you expect the CHR to perform well if you're only given that much, right? And there was uh, also a time when there was, uh, there was a comment that the CHR seems to be like a toothless tiger. We cannot fulfill um, whatever our mandate is. I mean, we cannot truly uh, accommodate all the things that are being demanded from us because of the meager budget that we have. So um, perhaps it will be good to analyze, to check how responsive our budget is. And I think um, uh, this is a, an opportunity for um, 2021, for the buying candidates for the 2022 election to check how we can um, adjust ha, um, the budget of the government, um, how things will be distributed um, fair for everyone, because um, more than prosecuting the cases, more than um, answering for the economic and social rights, it's also looking at um, how we are truly responding, how we are really addressing the needs of the people. Um, we need to look at the, the dignity of how everyone lives and then um, how we are properly addressing our issues and concerns. So I think those are the main things that uh, we have to consider. And um, if I may share um, bluntly here, uh, we have this human rights-based approach. And it will be good if the government can consider that, especially in their planning and budgeting, because um, by applying the HRBA or the human rights-based approach, as I've said, uh, that is the, the opportunity for them to see if they're, the allocation that they are proposing or they are getting from the government uh, is truly enough to address the needs of the people. So for me, I, I think that that's what we, we also need to do, um, especially now that we are facing um, trying times. We have this global health pandemic. We have threats um, of our human security. We have um, a lot of um, human rights violations happening, um, whether in the streets or even in places of detention. So there are a lot of um, things that we have to consider um, at this time. And it will be good if the government um, will learn how to be more responsive, how to be more proactive and how to really check and, and see if, if we are really giving that much to, all, to the public whom we are serving. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Princess. Uh, Ma'am Eta. Okay. Um, I, I claimed I was supposed to present um, uh, what do you call this PowerPoint, but let me uh, just go through because 
hindi pa natatapos yung gumagawa ng PowerPoint. That's okay. I think that um, may I qualify because thank you, Robert Sanders, who is related to Lolo Sanders from KFC. Just remember that. <laughs> Yan ang kanyang relasyon, ano? But thank you for your... Um, for your presentation. Kabilis-bilis at ang dami-dami mong sinabi. So, <clears throat> much of the time, nahihirapan ako sumunod. No? But the whole point is, when you said that there was too much law enforcement, uh, you know, gumaba tayo sa World Justice Index. Because there was, it seems like there's too much law enforcement and security focus rather than the administration of justice. Uh, am I correct, Robert? This is, this, this is the conclusion that you made. And I would like to qualify that because, and, and you in fact said that they should in fact correspond with each other. And I agree with you, they should correspond. Law enforcement, administration of justice, and security are all part of the same package if um, we look at it logically and reasonably. But um, lo logically, but it seems like um, the whole point is, has to do with, hindi pa sa root out the problem, we've been saying that, my goodness, decades ago we've been saying we have to root out the problem. Kahit yung mga general, pag kinausap nyo, yun ang sasabihin nila, we have to root out the problems. We have to root out the economic problems so that they will not become communists. We have to root out the problems. They become communists because we do not, uh, you know, solve the problems of uh, poverty. But I think that let us try to look at the question of whether or not they correspond in terms of how we view what security means, how we view what law enforcement means, and then of course, correspondingly, the administration of justice. Because what I was supposed to present to you precisely was the lack of enforcement of law. So what kind of laws are we talking about? It's not just the Duterte law. The laws are made, and if I may say, you know, if you use the United Nations definition of law, and law is one that is publicly promulgated, and then, of course, uh, equal, you know, that it is equal for everybody else. Everybody should be under the law equally. So it should be enforced equally, and then it should be consistent with international norms and human rights standards. So itatanong ngayon natin, yung bang law na pinatutupad ni Mr. Duterte, is it consistent? Even with the International United Nations Organization on drugs. You know, itatanong natin, because I'd say right now it's unconstitutional. He has been violating, excuse me for sounding this way, you know, but he has been violating international humanitarian law or Republic Act 9851. It's a statutory law already. Sa totoo lang. So is that yung law enforcement na pinag-uusapan natin? It's lawless. Or it's un unlawful rather. So yun yung problema. We have to, uh, Mr. Duterte has, uh, has a different view of what um, law is from his standards. And then when you go to security, what security are you talking about? Is it Mr. Duterte's security from the point of view of wala nang mga kwan, wala nang nag, ano, uh, nagdodroga, wala nang peddlers, wala nang aktivista, wala nang komunista. Yung ba ang iniisip niya? Eh kung gano'n ang pinag-uusap, yun kung gano'n ang iniisip niya, walang mangyayari. So may problema. I think the problem is in the view, no? the view of Mr. Duterte and his uh, government, their view of what law enforcement means and what security means from the viewpoint of the people. And the, the I think, starting ground here should be the United Nations concept of human security as against state security 
that goes back to the problems of the Rome, the Roman Empire, no? the concept of what security is. Eh, malam, nag, mag, magbago na yan. That you have state security only when you have a totality of human you know, security, as what Princess was saying, everybody has to enjoy this. And as what was pointed out by Tawag uh, Marito, Attorney, ano na pangalan mo? Si Attorney... Attorney GM? O yun, si Attorney GM, no? Na, and then, so, I, I'd like to look at it that way, Robert. May problema kasi. Kaya, me, it does not, uh, when you talk about administration of justice, how can you administer justice when what you are enforcing are unconstitutional or questionable laws from the beginning, from the first day? So I would look into that. So what I would like, what I wanted to show you was, you know, the one of the poorest sections of our population, which are the fisher folk, diba? the small fisher folk. Eh, ang ganda-ganda nung nakita ko, OSEANA, a non-government organization, has been doing some research. Alam ba ninyo kung anong nangyari? Even before, 2018, 2019, even before the COVID days, itong mga commercial fishers and trawlers, eh, ninanakaw na yung tubi, yung kwan, fish from the municipal waters. And in 1998, we were able to pass a very good law, the Fisheries Code, which says that 15 uh, kilometers of municipal waters belong to the little fisher folk. So I wanted to underscore that that is security. Economic security for the fisher folk, for their jobs, and then food security for the Filipino people. But that is being stolen from them by these commercial trawlers. So, lalo silang nagugutom. And with this climate change going on now, uh, I wanted to show you how vulnerable they were. They, they belong to the 10 poorest sections of the population. I, I had some uh, uh, statistics to show that. And so, economics, law enforcement, Robert, is so important for questions like the fisheries code, Diba? For questions like, uh, and because that brings about economic security, or for even questions like uh, the international human rights laws that are now statutory laws in our constitution. So that's my take. Uh, I think that if you don't mind, I think what, was, what we should do is to try to put together, you know, the, or to have a consensus of what national security means, what, uh, because that means economic security, that means social security, psychological security, and so on and so forth. No? But uh, at the same time, we should put that together with uh, law enforcement. When we talk about law enforcement, we mean law that is based on the rule of law enforcement. Kaya ang daming lumalaban dun sa anti-terror law, precisely it's because it's lawless, it's unconstitutional. Um, we don't have to go into the details of that, but, then, but I think that the whole point, so now you go to your budget, so you go to your philosophy, budget philosophy, when we are looking at this and what is the budget philosophy, they, be, they believe that build, 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 build by, you know, just focusing on infrastructure will bring about, you know, um, a dynamic economy or we will be able to economic, uh, economically recover, which I, I think is questionable again because they have gotten rid of uh, what they call this, the PPE is protective. Thank you very much for your uh, one, for your research, Eileen. Na, na nakatulong na malaki na tinitin ng lahat yung mga inalis nilang uh, provisions for the health security of our people. And then of course, as you had pointed out, 
they gave a lot of points for uh, uh, this uh, development of uh, the military. Just one point before I go out, before I stop now. I would like to ask Marina, the Coast Guards, the Navy, and then the so, Maritime Command. Yung Maritime Command na yan, I heard that there's a little money that was for, uh, brought to the PNP Maritime Command. Sa Senado yan, 50 million pesos to help strengthen their capacities. So I would like to get them to come together. They should come together co uh, co coherently and work for the uh, security, economic security of our fisher folk who are vulnerable to storms and typhoons and commercial fishers. And the PNP, uh, the PNP, what we call this, um, human rights affairs officers. Princess, dapat sinisingil ninyo yan. Parang, dapat sinisingil ninyo yan. Anong ginagawa nila? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Agree po. Um, actually, it's one of the ano rin po, CHR, yung ating accountability um, concerns po. Um, because it's not only the the people or the I mean the common people who are committing human rights violations, but um, the government is also implicated that um, they are also um, committing human rights violations. That's why po ma'am, di ba, I believe um, we should be together in promoting the human rights-based approach in planning and budgeting and how we operationalize things because the HRBA looks at the very core and the administration of justice um, requires a whole of government support. So it's not only the DOJ or the PNP, it should be everyone who, yeah. who, should, uh, who needs to look into all these things po ma'am. Hindi lang whole of government, whole of nation approach. Dapat yung approach okay. natin dito. At saka rules-based. Yes, rules-based and human rights-based approach. Ang dapat pananaw natin siguro. And that should include the budget philosophy. Ako, I question the budget philosophy in the first place. And maybe I lead and the uh, Rappler should start, you know, having discussions on that. Ano ba talaga yung budget philosophy nilang yan? As uh, pointed out, back it a bit. Anyway, I'll stop right there. Okay. May I, may Thank I, you. Uh, uh, and may I just quickly uh, uh, add uh, a, a few points? Uh, because uh, Ma'am Meta raised the, uh, the matter of the Human Rights Affairs Office of the PNP. Uh, and that brings me to my, uh, to, to my thought about you know, how the budgeting process needs to be, or in fact, how the mandates of government agencies need to be uh, fine-tuned uh, and then allocate resources along, along those lines. Because uh, in the case of the Human Rights Affairs Office of the PNP, uh, a lot is expected uh, from that office. The same with the uh, Human Rights Affairs Office of the military. A lot is expected of them to try to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to improve the human rights situation. But it's not, you look at their mandate, it's not really their mandate to investigate, for instance, extrajudicial killings or violations by uh, uh, soldiers or, uh, against activists. Um, their mandate is quite limited. Uh, these are, to be blunt about it, these are token agencies uh, that have not been really performing at, uh, uh, at their optimum, optimum uh, level because of their mandate. So, if the government can fine tune the mandate and then allocate the resources, then we, we have a better sh chance of making the, this human rights affairs office work with, for instance, the internal affairs service or the provo marshal of the AFP to try to improve investigative capacities, prosecutor, uh, prosecutorial assistance um, for cases of human rights violations implicating soldiers. So that's just one thing. I mean, the, uh, the, whole, I, the whole idea, the whole point is that the government right now has so many agencies that are not, whose, whose mandates are not very clear, whose human rights mandates are not very clear. Uh, and I think we're wasting a lot of money. The government is wasting a lot of money on this. So there has to be some fine tuning there, I think. Exactly. Exactly. 
you know, what I was talking to the PMP people from the HR Human Rights Affairs Office. Bakit wala kayong ginagawa? Ay, ako naman ang vlog with them. No? Bakit wala kayong ginagawa? You're supposed to be, uh, you know, implementing human rights. Ma'am, ang trabaho namin po sa aming PNP, yun, is, yun ang sabi nila. Kaya kami nandito in order to correct the one, violations committed by our PNP. Kaya dapat ini-improve namin ang ranks ng PNP namin. Hindi naman nag improve no? So, that's it. Robert, alam mo, doon tinignan ko ng PNP, tinanap ko yung budget for the PNP, Human Rights Affairs Office. Maybe it's so small and it's so minuscule. <laughs> so and important. There is no budget because there is no office that was reflected. They have education, ano, education program, mga ganon. Siguro nandun sa ilalim ng education program. <laughs> Yun. So, I think that's one of the things that we should really look into. If I, if I may? Right. Sure, attorney. Okay, so very interesting point raised by Eta. No, uh, it it depends really on how we define justice and security. Because when we say justice, do we mean a lot of people in jail? If we say security, do, do we mean no people criticizing the government? So that's something to think about indeed. And I think the government should rethink its vision of what justice and security is. The gov I do agree that the government should <laughs> comprehensively meet its human rights obligations. We have a lot of laws out there that's not being implemented fully, for example, such as the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act. For example, last year, gusto nila babaan yung minimum age of, of criminal responsibility. Kasi ang dami daw bata na kriminal, ginagamit ng kriminal, gusto yung amend yung Juvenile Justice Welfare Act. Pero kung titingnan mo, hindi naman na-implement ng maayos ng, yung, yung batas. Hindi lahat ng barangay ay equipped uh, para i-implement yung provisions ng JJWA. So kahit maganda yung batas, uh, hindi ito nabibigyan ng sapat na pondo, sapat na pag-implement. Another example, back in 2016, 2017, their benchmarks, and I think maybe now, their benchmarks for a successful drug war in the first few years was the number of people arrested and or killed. Kung yun yung benchmarks nila, at yun lang, no? it doesn't matter if they're convicted as long as they're arrested and a case was filed against them. Kung yun lang, bahala na ako acquitted or hindi, ma-overwhelm talaga ng cases yung justice system, ma-overwhelm talaga ng cases yung courts, yung PAO, and yung prosecutor. So th this goes to what Eta was saying that it illustrates how enforcing an unconstitutional policy runs counter to the administration of justice, no matter how big of a budget you have for it. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Jan, quickly, very quickly, Attorney Jan, on that point, I think on the... Uh, there's this disconnect between the prosecutorial uh, agents of the government and the police in terms of building up cases. So now, you know, really the police doesn't really care about what the DOJ or the prosecutors think as long as they can classify a case as yeah. solved because it's a suspect, then off they go and then they, you know, uh, they, they, go, they go on background. Uh, yung iba, yung bahala ng prosecutor. So talagang, there's this, uh, hindi, nag, hindi nagmamatch yung kanila mga expectations sa ginagawa. So malaking problema talaga yan. You know, oh, oh. Tama yun eh. Then I would like, within the DOJ prosecutorial ano, system, I'd like to ask also a question. No? So, I'd, si Gian, I'd like to ask you also what, what you would think as a lawyer. Alam nyo, yung panahon ko kasi, it was Leonard ko was killed when I was still chair of the CHR. So, ginawa namin national yung, yung issue dahil so, my God, sino ba? How dare they? And you know who killed them? It was the military who killed them. They were in EDC territory, at the Energy Development Corporation. And Leonard was studying yung mga plants sa loob ng EDC. It's a forest. Pero nandun sila. Pumasok itong mga police, ay, hindi police, militar. Pumasok sila. Pinagkamalan ba naman nila si Leonard and his staff as NPA. Isn't that the stupidest thing? Pagkakamalan nila. Tapos, eh, 
EDC is surrounded by may mga security guards. So nung tinanong namin, hindi ba ninyo kinausap yung mga security guards that you are already inside EDC territory? And this is this cannot be MPA because it's inside the EDC territory. Hindi uh, ma'am, kasi akala na ganun, ganun ka stupid talaga. And so, at a distance, alam nyo, it is 9851 is an IHL law. Di ba? You are prohibited from killing any civilian that you see there if the civilian is unidentified. Pag hindi siya, hindi ka nakakatiyak kung ito ay talagang kaaway o hindi of the state, hindi ba dapat pinapatay? E binaril nila. Plus yung dalawang staff niya, pinagbababaril nila. So that is how Leonard Ko was killed. Eh hindi ba ang kwan doon, na, nakalaban ko ang DOJ nun eh. <coughs> si, si Laila Dilimo pa nga yung DOJ. Tapos sabi niya, yung NBI ang nagbigay ng solusyon na yun. Anyway, uh, that's a point. Basta hindi kami nagtugma nun. Kasi ang tingin ko, Gian, hindi ba dapat uh, kwan, 9851 ang dapat kumulakuan, maging basis yan. Kasi alam mo ang kanilang kwan, resulta. Of course, the lawyer of uh, Leonard said it was murder. Pero tapos umalis naman na siya. So, nawala na, no? Ako, ang, ang aming position, it is a violation of 9851. Dahil hindi ka dapat pumapatay. And I don't know what the penalties are of 9851. Ang, ang kanilang resulta, um, reckless imprudence. Kaya homicide. Kaya hanggang sa ngayon, libre pa yung mga militar na bumaril sa kanya. Right, right. It's a very challenging thing. No? Kasi, pag, I mean, I agree. It could fall under, it, I think it should fall under the violation of IHL. Pero pagdating kasi sa mga cases na ipafile, the DOJ and the prosecutors have the discretion kung anong case ang ipafile nila ultimately. So, and and the thought process behind it is um, could be what evidence do we have at ano yung what can we prove given the evidence so i mean there's many paths you could file it under ihl you could file it for murder reckless imprudence resulting to homicide pwede naman either way but the prosecutor's office they have the sole discretion on which path to take baka rin nagkaroon ng plea bargaining it's also possible but i don't know i uh, i'm not really sure about it but that's that's quite unfortunate to hear it that they took the reckless imprudence Ah, and, and, and it's Kwan, no Gian, it's, I hope you don't mind, you know, ito na, ito na. <laughs> but it's, para sa akin, it's so important because may testigo, may mga testigo. So, hanggang ngayon, they do not yet have the proper trial. Anyway, ako, I will again appeal to you, Princess, ano, I, I say no matter how long it is, CHR should continue taking the case of Leonard Ko. Kasi, Um, yes, ma'am. Ganun yun. Oo, sabihin mo kay Kwan. Sabihan ko na si Chito dyan eh. Kailangan yung pagpatuloy natin. Anyway, sorry about that. But anyway, to me, we're talking about military security. We're talking about their concept of enforcement of the law. May mga testigo. Malakas ang testigo doon. So, it's just one concrete case of the military. Okay, um, I'll move on to another question. So, um, we're seeing large increases in the military and the police budgets. Um, I, I want to ask you, what does it mean, um, given that um, the anti-terrorism bill has been passed into law? Maybe we can start with Attorney Gian first, and then right. the right. human rights. Of course, uh, na mention naman na hindi natin alam kung saan kukunin yung like any item ng PNP or ng AFP kukunin but we're sure that bibigyan ng funds yan from a human rights practitioner's perspective of course part of the advocacy is that we are if you compare the human security act um na repeal ng anti-terror law there are some provisions na pinalala talaga for example the the warrantless arrest from from three days you can be detained up to 14 things like that and and the definition of terrorism itself no so 
there are some provisions that from, from our perspective as human rights advocates, are some, several provisions. In fact, maybe even the whole law itself uh, as unconstitutional. And, but unfortunately, yung, yun kasi, we, we always go back to the government policy and their definition of justice and security. Uh, well, of course, they're going to say that we're just trying to comply with UN obligations, with against to, to counter terrorism, which I think is a fair point. But also, international law is highly political, and and I mean you can justify it in so many ways, but it doesn't change the fact that the track record of the government here in the Philippines, uh, marami talagang human rights violations when it comes to implementing these laws, and we've seen it based from from ETA's experience, CHR's experience, right? So yun yung pangamba namin as. And yun 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 rin yung advocacy namin as lawyers from the human rights field. Okay, thank you. Um, Sir Carlos? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, obviously the budget and, and you see it in how they, uh, 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 they allotted a lot of money, uh, an inordinate amount of money, if I may say so, on, on the police and the military. I mean, it just shows you the priorities of this government. I mean, definitely... Uh, human rights is not a priority. It seems uh, very clear. Um, you know, just you know, just the fact that they they allotted sixteen billion uh, pesos to, uh, for instance, the National Task Force in ending local communist armed conflict from zero to sixteen point four billion. That's a lot of money, and uh, it's not very clear exactly what um, what that is for. They say it's for barangay development, but all we're seeing so far are. You know these uh, generals uh, red tacking everybody, um, uh, using the name of, of, of the task force. So, so it's uh, again that shows you the priority of, of, of this government. And really, it's it's quite hard to expect or demand uh, human rights compliance from this government when, from the very beginning, it was very clear that human rights is going to be it's not going to be. Uh, uh, a priority. It's going to be, in fact, uh, it's one of the first to go. Uh, this uh, the, uh, President Duterte himself uh, made this promise during the campaign, and he has uh, he has he has seen to it that that will happen, you know, and it has happened in the past four years. So it's quite hard. And then you see a progression of you know actions and, and policies that lead, for instance, to uh, uh, anti-terror bill, and you know it's it's just this increasing intensification of, 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 of policies and actions um, against human rights. And, and really, sometimes I feel like talking about you know, money, budget, in the context of, of, of all this is, is, is a bit, um, to be honest, is a bit uh, uh, out of touch sometimes. I feel that sometimes because really, how can you talk about allocating money from one agency to another for better use when the overall policy of this administration really is just to disregard human rights? So um, I'm, quite, I'm quite pessimistic in this regard. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but um, that should not stop people, NGOs, I lead, or you know, even the press from, from pressing on. And to really, I mean, from, from my perspective, from, my, from where I sit, I'm a, I'm a researcher. Human Rights Watch is a research advocacy group. And so we document what happens. I mean, we advocate for change on the ground. We advocate for better budgeting for human rights. But again, uh, those are quite, uh, 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 you know, those are tough uh, things to do uh, uh, because of the overall uh, climate right now of the, of not just of, of human rights violations, but of impunity. When you have a leader that has no qualms about you know, uh, undermining human rights and, you know, that has no, he doesn't hesitate about, you know, calling out human rights advocates and human rights groups and threatening them. So the environment is just not there. It's not conducive for any of us to really push this type of types of advocacy. I mean, we can push, but to expect, you know, meaningful, significant result is, I think, uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge. Thank you. Um, Ma'am Eta, do you want to add na bukas po yung uh, audio? Yeah, well, uh, tama naman. I, I agree with that, Kim. I agree with Kaloy and with Gian, no? uh, Actually, yung challenge na hinihingi nila, 
it is really the challenge of the people. Because if the government is, is so, you know, it's so limited in its, it, it, it obeys. Everybody in government, the whole cabinet, they obey Mr. Duterte and his distorted thinking, you know, his dysfunctional way of thinking. So it's really the people who should start uh, discussing and coming up. So, you know, the students came up with their, syempre hindi naman lumalabas sa media, no? Buti na lang ang Rappler, ang sipag-sipag na naglalabas ng mga points that have to come out, no? Um, so I, I feel like telling the students, kailangan ito eh, we have to articulate itong ganito, point by point, kailangan i-break down talaga. Kaya maganda yung ginawa ninyo ng ILEAD. And yung mga estudyante, pagka nagpaprotesta uh, sila, isa-isahin nila, eto. Siyempre, they have to connect it, of course, to education. Siyempre naman. But, you know, education suffers when the, the chief executive gives you a distorted view of what security is, of what law enforcement is, you know, of the whole point about governance. And uh, when we speak of governance, it's it's no longer just government, but it's always terra governance includes people, you know, civilians, people who are um, who are mobilized, but mobilized because they are informed. So to me, this is the strength of your webinar. This is the strength of your webinar, and it has to, you know, be popularized in layman's language. I have a, <coughs> I have a group in the communities. Eh. Hindi ko nalang nilagay sila. Pero ito yung mga tokhang. Ito yung mga na, nanay at anak ng mga tokhang victims. No? And um, kumusta na sila? Siyempre, tayod lamang sila. Tapos, nabaka rin sila. Pero sige pa rin sila. People never know about this. People never talk about them kasi they are the nameless. So, yun. Yun ang solusyon sa problema natin. Di ba? Yung ginagawa ninyong yan na napakaganda, napakahusay, o paano ngayon ilalapat in simple language doon sa mga nanay at saka sa mga anak. Di ba? Alam mo yung mga nanay, makon sila, matapang sila. Nung sabi ko sa kanila kasi namatay na yung mga anak nila, namatay yung mga asawa nila. O, oh, pagka marami pang tokhang, handa ba kayo na kunin sila at isama sila sa ating samahan? May pangalan na yung sama nila. Samahan sa paghihilom at saka edukasyon. Ay, yes ma, malakas na kami. At matapang na sila. Matatag na sila. Oh, at dinala ko naman sila sa CHR. Tapos na ba CHR yung... <laughs> Yung mga resolution na binigay namin sa inyo na ayun, <clears throat> dapat meron ng uh, binigay na namin yung case study sa inyo para may ayos na natin. Anyway, yun ang sagot ko, yun ang sagot ko na solusyon sa problema. Thank you, uh, Ms. Eka. Ms. Princess, do you want to add before I go on to another question? Yes, um, it's really challenging when other people see human rights as a stumbling block or as a hindrance to, to economic growth, to achieving justice, to ensuring um, security and all. Um, what's, what's really nice is when we come together, when, when we work together, we push back whatever it is that, that sees human rights as as a hindrance, because actually it's not. Um, when when we look at um, how we live right now, and dun yung yung essence pa rin ng human rights eh. People see kasi na para hindi ka bubusugin ng human rights. Sabihin nila, hindi ka safe pag, uh, pag inintindi mo ang human rights. Actually, yun nga yung napaka, kumbaga yun yung very essence natin. That, that is the very core of, of um, living a life of dignity which the government should be conscious about, which the government should should think about. Um, given the laws that are being passed, like the anti-terror law 
or or whatever na na dumadating ngayon um more than those laws more than the the measures the security measures or policies we also need to consider how lives will be uh, how lives are treated um kung sabihin nila na hindi nakakabusog or hindi nakakabuhay ang human rights um when, when you look at the the nitty gritty of it um actually yun nga yung nakakatulong sa atin eh kasi when we consider the concepts the principles um of human rights then then we will get to understand yung ating right to live the right to food the right to shelter everything so yung yung kumbaga the things that you breathe in and breathe out are all connected with human rights. So I think um, yun yung magandang i-consider din ng budget ng ating government na when we prioritize all these things, um, dapat nasa very core pa rin natin yung pag-promote at pag-protect ng ating human rights. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss Princess. So um, before we go on to the Q&A um, section po, no, I'd like to ask you uh, one last question. So um, what do you make Uh, what do you make of the lower um, I mean, you know, if you compare the budgets of correctional services and legal aid to, you know, administration of um, law, I mean, law enforcement, etc. Uh, what do you make of that? Sobrang mas maliit talaga yung legal aid and correctional services compared to, you know, yung binibigay to our state forces. Right. I'll go first. No? It's, been, it's been a problem for the longest time. Uh, talagang never, it, it's always been neglected, the, the, the budget for correctional services facilities. It's just that, I mean, back in 2016, prior to the drug war, crowded na yung mga jails. After the drug war, mas lalo lang lumala. And, and uh, it, so it's been, it's been a problem for the longest time. And I think the reason is because people still think that Uh, our concept of justice is still very punitive rather than restorative. So restorative justice is a concept that we keep uh, pushing in, in the human rights discussions. No? And the government policy, as you will see it, uh, look, just look at the laws, the drug laws, still very punitive. Uh, look at a lot of our outdated revised penal code. Look at the, the, the penalties of, of a lot of the laws there, still very punitive. So... And, and even the criminal procedures sometimes, although there has been strides to improve it, still very quite, quite punitive. So if, if you view it in that way, it makes sense why the correctional budget is still lagging behind. But if we can actually shift from, from a punitive standpoint to, to a more restorative framework, something that complies and tries its best to meet international human rights standards, uh, the way that we treat detainees, for example, I think we'll, we'll have better results. Um, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, a huge bump in the budget. Even, even just a few, yeah. <clears throat> even if you just put a bit more in the budget, but if you implement it properly and, you know, just build more facilities, more personnel and train uh, policymakers, educate them properly, it, it will sort itself out, I think. Uh, and we'll see significant changes. But up until we do that, it will just keep going. <laughs> yeah. So uh, stop there, yeah. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, um, Attorney Gianna, that's a good point. I think also that uh, we also have to take into account, you know, a larger cultural and political uh, nuance of, of this. Um, you have also to keep in mind that restorative justice is not something that is not happening only because the government does not have a clear policy on that, but also because from the very beginning, um, the policy of this government, and in fact, even Duterte himself, President Duterte himself, they've demonized, uh, dehumanized uh, a lot of these people, the drug users, suspected criminals. Uh, they are the dregs of the society. They're zombies. We, do, we, we don't have to spend money on these you know, dregs of society. So that overall overarching mentality, I think, also plays a key role. And in the stigma of the stigma of uh, conviction of even even uh, prosecution is quite is quite uh, uh, um, uh, I would say uh, serious in in Philippine society, so that um, you know it it I think translates to uh, to this you know government agencies or heads of government or government officials who are not invested 
you know, politically or culturally, even intellectually, about uh, restoring these people, or, or, or you know, uh, and making sure that they go back to, uh, to, 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 to the fold of society in one piece. You know, we don't have that. And just to illustrate how uh, lacking we are in this regard, nobody, for instance, is talking about harm reduction. Uh, in the drug war or in the drug campaign, and 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 you know, harm reduction is basically uh, the idea, the principle that you recognize that, for instance, a problem exists or a drug problem exists, but you take steps to try to mitigate the harm or to reduce the harm that the individual uh, does to himself or uh, you know his family or society. But we don't have that. What we have, you know, are are, are correctional facilities. What we have are jails. What we have are um, you know, are, are really punitive uh, 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 ways of dealing with those who, who violate our law. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the way I look at it. Can I say something? Thank you, sir. Sure, Pa. Uh, maybe, because looking at that, actually, pr Princess, again, you see HR, you see HR, you see it. Pero yung ALG, at saka yung CHR, at saka yung mga NGOs, we, we, we used to come together and um, work this out in communities. No? But one nice thing that we have been able to do is not just in communities, ako, as chair of the CHR, I, I had a lot of fun, eh, yung advantage. Pinupuntahan ko yung ki Mayor Mal Mal his name, Malipitan sa Kaluokan. Di ba yun, ang dami, dami, dami nila. So yun, I would go to them, handa ba kayo na magkaroon tayo ng pag-aaral? Yun nga, na paano hindi dapat punitive, kundi dapat restorative ang pagbabalik ng tao sa kanyang pagiging makatao. May problema siya, may sakit siya. At syempre, sasabihin nila, yes ma'am, gusto namin yun. CHR has the authority. So baka pwede siyang guma gumawa ng ganoon na pamamaraan dito sa mga areas na kung saan nandun yung mga regions ninyo and then pwede uh, puntahan itong mga correctional uh, facilities na ito. I used to give pag-aaral sa kanila eh na tama yung sinasabi ni Kaloye na hindi dapat punitive kung hindi restorative. Ibalik mo ang kanyang pagkatao. Pero hindi lamang sa ganun, kung hindi, kailangan may material benefits. Yung livelihood and so on and so forth. <coughs> so, pwede namang gawin yan dahil sa may mga eskwela nga ngayon na nagtuturo ng livelihood. Tulad ng sa St. Benil, doon ako nag nagtuturo sa De La Salle. Uh, nagtuturo sila ng livelihood program. So, I was able to link them to the to kang victims. So natuto yung mga, ba, mga nanay ng mga culinary you know, ways ng livelihood. So in other words, unti-unti, babalaki yung kanyang pagiging makatao at saka at the same time, doon na magiging malinaw sa kanila, kanila yung sinasabi ni Princess na uh, economic rights, right to work, right to life, Lahat yung mga bagay na yan, nagiging konkreto na hindi mga abstract kung pinag-uusapan. We can still do it. Eh. We can still do it. Um, ALG, GM, we, we used to have a community kung noon eh. Nagpupunta kami sa mga communities. Of course, may problema natin ngayon. May, meron tayong COVID. But maybe we can do who, who is, we can have an education program eh. CHR and ALG. Simulan ninyo sa ganon. Parang ito, ito, I live, at saka Rappler. Tapos dagdagdagdag lamang sila. But we can do something like that. And then find that. You can try to, to go to Bishop, <laughs> my favorite Bishop, uh, Pablo, sa Kaluokan. And then there are other seminarians or priests. <laughs> Pwede namang gawin yun na <clears throat> promotional educational program. Then you can invite 
da HR H Rao. Ayun, para si Mama. Ay, hindi lamang 'yon. I always the, always invited yung yung the girl, the woman police, so women's and children's desk. So sila kakampi sila doon sa hindi dapat ibaba ang age ng kuan discernment ng bata to 12 years old o 11 o 9 years old yata. Gusto ni tumingin ito. Yun ang concrete. Yes ma'am. Uh, be, before we go to Sorry, uh, before we go to um Miss Princess now. Siguro dagdag ko lang din na question ko sa inyo. Um I I saw that the confidential funds of the Commission on Human Rights was um removed uh no, um reduced to a mere 1 million, I think. Um how does that um affect your investigations for? Um it remains very challenging for the CHR to pursue its um, um, its investigation. Pero yun nga, um, just like what we always do, we remain um, kumbaga, striving for excellence. We remain to be responsive to the demands of our clients. And we continue to, to um, ensure that we protect and promote the human rights of everyone. And I think um, the points raised by, by Chair Eta, by Sir Carlos and Attorney Gian, they're very good na um, we, we collaborate, we come together. Um, again, the CHR is just a small agency, but with others helping us like the ALG, the other CSOs, um, the HRAO or other government agencies, um, together we, we can be stronger. Sabi nga, di ba po? Parang kumbaga, sama-sama tayo together um, in ensuring that um, human rights um, is, a, is a hold. Um, and then yung sinasabi natin na restorative justice, it is considered. And yung ating um, education, um, it, it's really uh, nice to push yung ating education because it will help that to, um, to have that kind of culture, the human rights culture. Um, yun nga, yung kumbaga, we will transition now from from the the very kumbaga, ancient way of thinking to a more progressive um, kumbaga, way of living na tayo. Like, instead of seeing criminals as parang wala na, wala na silang chance, wala na silang hope, but we help them to contribute to the society. We help them to contribute to the economy, to, to security, I, I mean, kumbaga, we give each other a chance. So that's my take on, on all these discussions. Can I add? Okay. Uh, it's very sure, sure. Um, uh, I agree. Um, to me, it seems ridiculous that we're here defending human rights when the entire uh, basis of, the, uh, no, of, of what government does really relies on human rights in the first place. You get free public education because of human rights free hospitals, free, et cetera, et cetera. That's why the military and PNP exist to protect human rights, right? And the CHR was established to guard against state uh, parang, um, abuses uh, to those. So um, I think aside from having internal conversations amongst ourselves, as it is um, part of our duty diba, as citizens, um, it also, ano eh, parang, yes, CH, I agree that CHR has the authority to do that. But I think it would also behoove us to... Um, pressure other elements of the government to uh, agree and give them authority and diba, translate that um, authority and expand it. Uh, make them, parang bigyan nyo sila ng funds to be able to do what they need to do. Um, for example, um, it for me, well, this is personally 20, 2016 to 2019, you see a lot of extrajudicial killings. Why wasn't, um, why wasn't the increase in funds for investigations correspondingly increased? Why were they capacitated as well? Is that a denial on the existence of this? So um, uh, in all of this, we've been talking about implementation, administration of justice, but then we go back to the entry point of a conversation, which is budget. Um, we're, at, we're at crunch time now. And sometimes the intervention could be just as simple as giving the offices that need the resources, the resources that they need, just so uh, they can do their jobs. So and um just so we you know we we also don't get lost in the conversation because um it's it's important that we engage among ourselves as civil society but it's also important that as civil society we engage government because that's where the decisions get made that's where the money lies and it's our money in the first place 
So uh, we should have a say in, you know, in, in, if, if we can't directly uh, influence the, you know, the changes in the numbers, then at least let it be known to our representatives that we're watching. Parang this is the priority we want, and this is what we want to carry uh, for succeeding years. Um, Attorney Jen, just to quickly add to that, I'm sorry, um, that's an excellent point. Uh, and I want to quickly add to that, uh, to say that, you know, sometimes it's, it's unfair of this, uh, for us to really expect just to improve the human rights condition of a country and, and, and expect the CHR all by itself to do that. Uh, there's this, there's this uh, idea that the only entity that deals with human rights in the Philippines is the CHR, which is, you know, probably not even 25% of it. Uh, which goes, which brings me to Attorney Jian's point. There are other agencies in government that has their mandate has to do with, with human rights. And in fact, given given uh, even if they have this limited allocation in the budget, they can do a lot of things to try to improve human rights uh, within their ambit of influence. Uh, let me, tell, for instance, the DSWD. I'm sure it can get creative and proactive in helping, for instance, the orphans of the drug war. And not just you know, not just use existing money uh, uh, that that are not that are not a lot, but uh, you know, they. I'm sure they can juggle, not juggle illegally, but I'm sure they can use uh, resources to address that specific problem. We have the National Commission on Indigenous People. They are a key player in protecting the rights of the Lumads. What are they doing? Are they are in fact? Uh, capacitated to uh, uh, to deal with human rights issues facing the Luman. We have uh, the National Commission on Women. What are they doing? Are they, in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, adv advancing the cause of women and also the National Youth Commission, especially uh, also the DepEd, for instance, especially for LG LGBT youth. Uh, who are very, very uh, at risk uh, from discrimination. So, you know, these are just some issues that it's not just a CHR that should be doing these things. And it's not just the NGOs. There are government agencies that have the money, that have the work with all, that have the mandate to do this. The question is, are they doing it or are they taking cues from, you know, from Malacanang? Uh, so that's my added point. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, I think Attorney Jean wants to add. Right, right. I totally agree with, with you, Robert and, and Carlos. Uh, and I do, of course, totally agree that we should work with, with other government agencies. From ALG's projects, we have been working with, in the past 10 years now, we've had projects where we engaged AFP, PNP, CHR, and, and other NGOs in certain pilot areas where we discuss their issues, how do we uh, protect civil political rights, economic social rights. One of the key challenges though was, so it's been running since 20, 2010, um, we've built strong relationships with the PNP and AFP human rights offices with our NGO partners. But for some reason, <laughs> come 2016, um, that relationship soured because all of a sudden, I mean, the PNP wasn't attending or responding to our invitations despite, you know, due, due notice. O parang very limited na lang, if not outright um, being absent from the dialogues. So I mean, we, we are ready to work with them. We are ready to, we are willing to work with them. We are, offer our services. But this lack of cooperation or rather lack of interest in cooperating, even as far as requesting for documents for investigations of killings, I mean, if they're really sincere, uh, they wouldn't, they shouldn't withhold police reports, something as trivial as a police report. They should give it to to victims or families or to the lawyers even, but but they're not. They're saying it's for national security reasons. So I mean, they have. You don't need a lot of money to produce that police report, and they have a lot of funds. But if they really want to investigate or at least help in the investigation, they should provide those things. So it makes me quite um, skeptical about their willingness to cooperate with with NGOs and and meet human rights obligations. But I mean, rest assured, uh, we in the human rights field. Um, the CSOs, we want to work with you. We want to work with the government. We're willing to. And we believe that you can do it. And if you need our expertise, we're just here. But thank you. Very, very nice points. Uh, thank you, Attorney Gian. Um, Ma'am Eta. Um, siguro, before we go to Ms. Eta, lang, I just want to 
um, ask uh, everyone, uh, since this topic has been opened already, do you think um, the budget of the CHR should be increased? The same as some, there are some people saying that the PNP should be defunded. Mameta? Yeah, of course it should be increased. No? Um, um, the budget of the PNP should be rationalized. Uh, just, just certain points lamang, no? Uh, we, we have in the CHR what is known as the National Monitoring System. That involves all government agencies. We used to meet regularly. Ngayon, sa, sa Malacanang, andong pa siya eh. There is what is known as the Presidential Committee for Human Rights. He is supposed to uh, well help in developing human rights within the executive agencies. So, Princess, you ask Chair Chito, you meet, write a letter to him, and then he should take care. See, he used to do that for me. That was invite all local uh, agencies of government, the national agencies of government, up to in the ILG and so on. You could start with something like that. <clears throat> and then remind them that the Philippines is a state party to eight of nine core international human rights instruments. So nandun na lahat yun, yung mga functions nila, tsaka, et cetera, no? We are a state party. We're not just a signatory. So that's something that I, I, in response to what Kaloy and uh, Gian were saying. And uh, invite, uh, actually it was Robert Kapala who suggested that. It's a very valid uh, point that we should have. Kasi crunch time na nga. So introduce yung ganong system so that uh, they should have education programs on human rights. Para dun sa aking little issue na mahalagang kuan, yung concrete issue, yung fisher folk, and can we ask, ewan ko Robert, how this can be done, you know, na merong 50 million pesos eh, that was given for the official folks, strengthening the official folks. Maliit lang naman yun sa Senado ngayon. So yung perang yun, eh, kung pwedeng magamit yun to capacitate the official folk, ay to capacitate the PMP um, Maritime Command, of course, in the way of uh, being one, yung, in securing the fisher folk within the particular area, the waters against the, uh, what they call this, against the commercial fishers. And then um, also to ask the H, H round, it's the Human Rights Affairs Office of the different areas to help and provide uh, human rights uh, support and protection to the Philippine National Police Command, uh, Maritime Command. Yun yung konkretong konkreto kung pwedeng magawa yun. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Eta. Um, I think um, Sir, Car Sir Carlos needs to leave na in a while, um, but I'll ask him to just jump in kung ano po yung uh, thoughts niya about defunding PNP, increasing budget uh, sa CHR before you leave. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I need to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I need to jump off. But before I go, um, I I think it's going to be quite uh, uh, it's, a, it's a drastic thing to suggest to defund uh, the PNP. I mean, look, uh, we don't like the way things are going, but uh, we need we need the police. I uh, I think uh, more than defunding or as I you know, more than defunding the police, we should insist on accountability from the police for for all these uh, uh, human rights violations that uh, uh, they are clearly uh, implicated in. I mean, that's the way to, to make sure that they function as, uh, as protector of, of the people. Um, and, and really, you know, uh, uh, instead of sidelining them, we ought to uh, work into ensuring that they, uh, uh, they perform their mandate as uh, um, 
you know, as, as uh, effectively as possible. Now, as to the CHR budget, I mean, it goes with, without saying that we need to increase the budget of the CHR. I mean, uh, you see, uh, there's this, there has been an increase of budget from the 20, from 2016 up to 2019, but it's, it's tapering off. Uh, a lot of these increases are nominal. Uh, there are, I understand, uh, uh, DBM withholds a lot of money uh, from the CHR. Um, so it's... Uh, there's a there's a matter of increasing the budget, but also ensuring that whatever little money they have are 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 you know are are, are released uh, in time uh, and used properly. I think that's a key. And also, I think uh, on a more significant level, I think uh, what needs to change is not just the money that the CHR has, but really the attitude of the government toward the CHR in general and toward human rights in general. I mean, the the, the attitude towards CHR since 2016 has always been confrontational, has all, they see CH, CHR as, as uh, you know, as, as, as the enemy, uh, not an ally, uh, uh, which is the most uh, fundamental problem. So, the, you know, we can cry until we're blue, in, we're blue in the face about increasing the budget of the CHR, but when you have this overarching policy against the CHR and against human rights in general, you know, uh, continent talaga ang magagawa. So I think we need to press on, we need to challenge this government to really, as Eta points out, uh, Kanina, to really make sure that it complies with its international mandate or international commitments on human rights, and that's that's uh, that's uh, very very important. And I think on that note, I have to say goodbye first. Uh, I need to attend to something, and it's been uh, really really great speaking to you guys here and sharing uh, thoughts with you. And, and I wish you all the luck. Uh, thank you, Sir Kaloy. Can goodbye, I jump in? Uh, from that, thank you. Uh, uh, sure. Okay, I'll jump in from that. Um, I know, yeah, uh, we need more I know, concrete recommendations, like what Mom Eta says, because it's, um, you know, it's so easy. You, it, parang it's very easy to know when something is unfair, when something is off, but it's very hard to ask for a correction of that, how you correct the system, especially when it comes to security or justice. Now, when it comes to education, to social protection, to health, you kind of know how to ask for it. Eh? More hospitals, more beds, more, ganyan, more books, more funding. Um, and then for social protection, um, diba, more livelihood assistance. When it comes to security, it's so hard to ask because you have a whole system to contend against. And you know that that system is built purposefully. But it's built that way so that it's fair, so that the calculus is justice. I agree with the analysis of Sir Koloy, na parang you see HRP and Pichaka ano, um, AFP, they should not see each other as in a very combative manner. Um, in a way, the CHR is there actually. They should, diba? if the goal is justice, then they all exist for the same purpose, which is to maintain peace and order and make sure na, um, there's not, nothing unjust that happens in society. Those who violate it are held to account. The CHR actually exists to help PNP and AFP. When there are grave violations of human rights, people tend to lose their trust in the police and in the military. And in the long run, that harms the institutions. When people don't really believe on the law enforcers, on the military, parang magbe-breakdown na yan eh. Parang ngayon, there's this general feeling of you know, unease and uh, being unsafe. The CHR exists in order to help rectify that situation. Hold those who violated um, uh, human rights to account so that uh, people can begin to move forward and then trust is restored in the institution as well. But these were not made uh, to, uh, no, to fight uh, against themselves. They're made to coexist. It's just rather unfortunate, siguro. The politics surrounding us uh, has made it uh, seem that way. So um, when we say defunding the police, it's rather aggressive. Kasi parang, diba, no one gets any joy from seeing a human rights violation, of course, least of all the CHR, when it has to exercise its role. Um, I agree with them, it should be rationalized. Um, kung itataas nyo yung law enforcement and military, make sure hindi maiwan yung nurses, hindi maiwan yung doctors, yung educators, etc., etc. Because, um, because again, it, the, the security they're talking about isn't really about traditional security or state security anymore. It's not about just being safe from crime or being killed. It's also about living a life that is uh, relatively secure, that lets you pursue your happiness. So, yun. Um, that that uh, no, there, there's my point there. It isn't really be combative. Eh? They they they're really meant to coexist with each other. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Um. See, before um others um could 
uh, chime in. Si Ms. Princess po muna, what do you think about um, increasing the, uh, the budget of the, CH the CHR and where should it go? Well, I welcome, I, actually we, we welcome the increase in budget because I think that will help us um, prove that we're not the toothless tiger that some people are, are you know, commenting on us. Uh, I also agree with what Shereta said, na we need to rationalize the funds. Um, I think it's very very drastic if we decrease or, or defund the PNP because we, we need the security sector, of course, to maintain uh, peace and order in our land. Uh, what I also um, agree on is what Robert said, na, oh my God, there should be a, a harmonization between PNP, between CHR, and the justice sector, and all those involved in the government to ensure that uh, Things are, are moving well, and that it's not that kumbaga, walang naiiwan eh. Everyone gets to um, experience the inclusivity. Um, no one gets left behind, uh, that we are all functioning well. We are all mindful um, of each other's welfare, of each other's uh, dignity. So I think that's it. Um, we rationalize, we balance. Um, we make sure that, you know, um, everything is, is well and, and smooth. Kumbaga, para walang away. Yun lang naman din yung gusto natin. Of course, we all want yung, yung peace, yung harmony, and security among each other. So, thank you. For the CHR, what projects or programs um, yung may kailangan talaga ng priority na ma if ever? This is something that the Congress uh, would uh, consider during the bicam. Mm -mm. Um, yes, the number one ano pa rin namin is of course the investigation, um, because um, currently we have um, several thousands of cases that we need to resolve, um, and of course the the accountability um, kumbaga measure or, or program that we also need to put the government or, or whoever is um, talagang kumbaga, um, kumbaga guilty of human rights violation, we need to hold them accountable for, for whatever um, they did. So, yun naman din yung mga priority natin. And then we also have yung sa jail visitation, like what Chair Eta said, um, we're very mindful po na to ensure that we enhance ang ating jail visitation program sa CHR. In fact, we are working on the interim national preventive mechanism because um, we need to ensure that the um, persons um, deprived of their liber liberties are also protected of their rights. Um, at the same time, the continuing uh, human rights education program among the security sector and then even um, sa ating mga schools, sa academe, um, even the faith-based organizations. So um, continuous naman po yun sa CHR. So yun yung mga priority natin. And then of course, the, the policy advisory, the monitoring, um, we also have uh, that kind of um, kumbaga, a thrust in the CHR. Um, and aside from uh, giving out the mga policy advisories, we also have the sectoral monitoring. That's why we have the, the Gender Equality and Women's Human Rights Center. We have the Child Rights, the ESER, and even the Crisis and Conflict. So kumbaga, it's, it's very comprehensive um, when we work here at CHR. We, we make sure that um, all the sectors, um, all, all the stakeholders, are given um, utmost consideration and of course priority po. Thank you so much, Paul, Miss Princess. Um, Can I? Sure, I, sure, okay. I'll turn you. Sure. So, uh, coming from that, no, I, I agree with with Robert in so far as I mean, in simple terms, it's sana all, de ba? Sana all to maas yung sweldo, hindi lang yung police, pati yung nurses, teachers, and sana. And and when when you say when we say uh, defunding the police, I, I, it's not so much for me as lowering the salaries of the police. No, of course not. They, they, we need the police so, and we need their projects. It's just that there are some items, for example, that the NTFL CAC, the National Task Force to End Communist, Local Communist Armed Conflict, it has 1 billion pesos in appropriations. And how do you justify that when, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a relatively new arm, 
and so far all of they done is i i would say red tag certain groups and certain individuals we can have that i mean of course sure sige bigay natin pero can't they operate under 500 million and then ha- give the 500 million to chr's independent investigation because the police police afp pnp would say that we're doing investigations to clean ourselves yes but it's not an independent investigation can you just imagine the police investigating itself and you know in international obligations you need to have for you to rise yung sa justice uh, benchmarks no kailangan iniimbestigahan sila ng independent and impartial investigations and that's where chr steps in no and that's why we need to give so that's why i agree with princess and i would second that give more funds to their investigations jail visitations arm because they're the ones who can possibly rationalize the budget being given to the police if if chr can say yes the police is actually um meeting and observing proper proper human rights standards and protocols then it's okay you can keep giving them this amount of budget but if we're not g- g- getting that enough imp- impartial and independent investigation parang ang hirap i-justify na sobrang laki nung sa police meanwhile yung iba nagsasacrifice na ko-compromise yung sana na ibigay sa ibang sectors to to balance out because as you can see the police uh, budget almost tripled as presented earlier So and for you to triple that it means that you sacrificed several others it means that you you defunded other agencies for you to bloat it up that much so i would like to think of it that way but yeah i i would second that recommendation by princess thank you attorney gian um miss eta <clears throat> yeah well when i said rationalize the pmp budget um it means that They do not spend so much money in their tokhang operations. They do not kill, you know, extra Jewish. They they do not get away with murder, because that's getting away with murder when they do extra judicial killings, that are justified by the palace itself. No, so you rationalize the PNP budget, but it has to be within the constitution. They should not. In fact, an anti-death penalty. Tayo eh. We have. We actually have the anti-death penalty. But who cares about the anti-death penalty? They're killing them even without the <clears throat> the law itself. That's why they want to bring back the law so that they can be justified in their extrajudicial killings. So. Um, That is how I would look at the police, uh, you know. And um, gosh, I wish, you know, I wish in the House of Representatives or even in the Senate, you know, they they are they they address these matters in that way. But and then put more teeth in the protection uh, capacity of the police. Especially when it comes to the vulnerable sectors, like the indigenous peoples, like the fisher folk, like the farmers, you know, the people who really matter because they are vulnerable. Yeah. So that's the way I would look. Sak sak po naman sa CHR. Tama yun, of course, I will be in favor of that. And more investigation that should go on, but I suggest, you know, I suggest really, princess, we should do more education within the government itself, human rights education within the government, and get people um, to join. It, what no man said, the government employees are willing, <clears throat> and they're okay. They're open, so it's important for us to be able to find <clears throat> find ways of giving education to the government employees and the principals. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Miss Eta. Um, we need to wrap up. Uh, we've already extended um, way past uh, our time. Um, but before we wrap up, there's just. 
one question that I think needs to be answered. Um, I see this is from an anonymous attendee, um, and I think this is um, this is asked genuinely um, curiously. If military, if the military protects, um, should be protecting human rights, why does other armies violate the importance of human rights? Why does what? The why does army some some military personnel violate? Um, the importance of human rights? Ay, that's easy to answer. Number one, some of the, they just don't know. They just don't know or they have a distorted understanding of human rights. But number two, they are convinced by the policy above. Because if the policy above justifies violation of human rights, Ang military hierarchical yan, eh, vertical yan, parang yung PNP. They will follow whatever is said by whoever is the central authority. And that's the way they violate. But I'll tell you something. Because <clears throat> I'll never forget, in a seminar of the military, um, a particular person, who must have been a major, in an encounter, Encounter na nga with the NPA yan eh. And he had his best friend with him. Handa na sila, mag-a-attack, magbabarilan na sila. And they were in a good position. Then all of a sudden, but this guy who was talking to me had education in human rights. Tapos, tumabas yung isang bata. Doon sa area ng military. Sa so, Asia yung nag-o-order. Tapos sabi niya, halt. Walang babaril. Kasi yung bata, yung nandun. Ang ginawa ng NPA, sila yung bumaril na, na, na matay yung kanyang best friend. And he was so depressed. So kinukwento niya yan, maiyak-iyak siya nung kinukwento niya yan. I forgot his name, but I will never forget that. And do you regret what you had ordered? Sabi ko, no, I did not. At the expense of my best friend, he was my best friend, but I knew that it was right. We should not shoot because that would mean shooting the child. And yun. Kaya mababait ang sundalo. They're human beings. Ganun din ang police. Pero kailangan makausap natin. We have to reach out to them. Yun. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Eta. Can I ask for um, some final thoughts um, before we close this webinar? Let's start with um, um, Attorney Gian, uh, Miss Princess, Miss Eta, and then Robert. Right. So, just to sum up everything that has been said, no, um, we need to look at justice beyond just filing cases, beyond just uh, going to court and putting people in jail and just punishing people. We need to look at justice on a bigger perspective outside of the courts, outside of the POW, outside of the prosecutor's office, outside of the police. And in, when we speak of justice and security, as mentioned earlier, we need to rethink our concept of justice and security. Is it just trying to punish people or are we trying to restore people, restore the humanity of those who have been dehumanized, restore the humanity of those who have been demonized? And I hope, I, as, I would agree as well that the budget reflects the government policy. So I hope that in the future, once we change the minds of people, once we educate more people about the importance of human rights and human dignity, that this will reflect uh, in the national budget and that we will provide more support to other projects, to more, more uh, social development and, and harm reduction things like that, rather than, rather than just putting budget in filing cases and convicting people. So I hope we keep that in mind in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Princess? Uh, yes. Um, talking about the national budget, I think what's, um, what's really important right now is we learn to prioritize and we also rationalize um, we need to have that check and balance of how things um, are being funded by the government. I mean, everything is important in the government, whether um, the works of 
uh, the, the police, the, the justice, the justice system, the judiciary, and all. Um, it, it's just making sure that we work together for the good of everyone. We ensure that um, the dignity is, um, is protected. Um, we ensure that human lives are, 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 are saved, um, are respected, and that we all come together and make this place as better as we can, you know, do with, uh, with the budget that we have. So, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mom Eta, final thoughts? Are oh, you on mute, Bob? First of all, thank you very much to iLead and to Rappler for this very useful, very valid um, webinar. Patapos na kayo, no? You've been having webinars for on the budget, no? So I guess if you can have the those webinars, the results of your budget uh, one, kasi wala na tayong halos magagawa. But if you can get these webinars in such a way that it becomes understandable to the people, especially to the communities, and then convince the policymakers about the importance of, uh, you know, the work, the importance of a human rights-based and rule of law-based budget. Then maybe we can get somewhere. But all, uh, we have to work on the police protection of our <laughs> of our vulnerable sectors. Because that's community. Okay, you don't know what's happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And lastly, Robert. And um, so today we saw a piece of security in the more traditional sense because we looked at law enforcement. Um, we looked at the military, armed forces, the state. But like as was pointed out, as we saw, um, security is developed to a concept that is so much more than that. Actually, when you look at the entire budget, it should be a budget that promotes uh, human security, about, um, social, economic, uh, environmental, political, cultural, etc. As a whole, uh, it should be uh, it should be it should be a document that promotes that, and that if the budget gives rise to strong feelings of insecurity to a significant number of people. And it's a budget that should be revisited, right? Um, when we talk about security, especially uh, in the national sense, um, and it, it, everyone should be secure, not just uh, not just few. Um, if you're sick, because the important thing there is, if you're secure now, who knows what the next circumstance will come along that will make you insecure? And hopefully, uh, we want to prevent that situation where it will be you who will be voiceless, it will be who will be needing. So um, thank you very speakers for uh, for joining us today, especially also to our attendees. A lot of them are students, I think, in senior high. So it's a very, very informative forum to be talking about human security and justice, especially uh, in informing the next generation. So maraming salamat. Um, we'll be having, I think, our last uh, webinar next week on health. So uh, thank you. Maraming, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, uh, you, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for our students for attending, um, some of our viewers as well. Thank you, Miss Eta, Miss Princess, um, Attorney Gian, and also Sir Kaloy, who um, already have to leave um, this webinar. We discussed, um, we dis uh, our panelists uh, mentioned, um, you know, more on the fundamental questions. Um, how do we actually define justice, security, and human rights? And what is the view, the view that is being employed in, you know, in crafting the, in crafting the budgets for the specific, um, for the specific sectors? Um, we also discussed um, how perhaps fine tuning the mandate will uh, help how um, human rights. Um, uh, the, the human rights part uh, services in other um, agencies aside from the CHR um, can help in you know promoting um, human rights um, principles or making human rights you know something felt um, in, on the ground though. 
Um, I think um, this is also very important because, you know, especially for the people, misal tinatanong nga nila, and tama yung ibang panelists nga natin na sinabi nila, nakakain ba yung human rights? And and important talaga that other agencies, you know, strengthen and be, uh, mabigyan ng pansin yung parte na yun ng um, uh, ahensya nila at yung pondo na gagamitin nila para ma- maramdaman talaga yun. And um, lastly, there was also... Um, discussions about you know um how the CHR budget can be improved um can be increased um perhaps some um, more specific most specifically um i mean specifically on jail visitation and investigation and we're hoping that this is something that um could be taken up uh, during the bicam and again thank you so much everyone to our panelists to our um viewers to the students who attended this webinar um i am ikari thank you for joining us